uh, better understand or so that uh, they could uh, comprehend the spiritual truth uh, in, um, in an earthly story. But this is not why Jesus said that he spoke in parables. In verse 11, we, sa we see that he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So we have two groups of people here. One group among the multitude that Jesus refers to as you, and another group that he refers to as them. And he says if you're in the you group, uh, you, you'll be able to understand the parables. But if you're in the them group, you won't be able to understand them because I'm speaking in this parabolic manner so that they won't understand. And notice that he calls these sayings mysteries. Now, this word is used quite frequently in the New Testament. Various things are called um, uh, mysteries. For instance, the Bible speaks of the mystery of, of iniquity and the mystery of this age, and he speaks of uh, Christ in you as being a spiritual mystery. Uh, so uh, he speaks of uh, quite a number of situations as being mysteries. And if we followed all of these through, we'd find that a mystery in the Bible is uh, something which has not otherwise been revealed or has not yet been clearly unfolded. It's still somewhat hidden. Uh, now, God chooses that certain truths be hidden for a certain period of time. He also chooses that certain things be hidden to certain people. For instance, in the 11th chapter of Matthew, one time he was... Uh, uh, speaking and in the 25th verse we're told in that 11th chapter that uh, he lifted up his uh, face towards the Father and he says I thank thee O Father of heaven and earth that thou hast hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them unto babes so there again you see he had a group to whom he wanted to hide certain truths and he had a group to whom he wanted to unfold or reveal certain truths and this is why he spoke in parables because he wanted to hide certain truths from certain people. So you say, well, why did he just start speaking in parables at this particular point? Because this was well into his ministry. He had been ministering uh, to multitudes uh, for some time. See, we're, uh, the uh, book of Matthew is basically uh, chronological, uh, beginning uh, with his ministry and then on to his uh, death and resurrection. And so we're well into the middle of uh, Matthew here and we're probably somewhere uh, about the middle of his of his time of ministry and previous to this he had not used the parabolic form of, of speaking so why is it that at this point he wants to hide certain things that he's saying uh, since he had previous to this uh, been uh, fairly open and above board well in order to understand this we have to understand the setting of the Gospel of Matthew in uh, the group of uh, books that we call the four Gospels. Uh, and we'll do that in just a moment. But I might say another word about the eight parables. If you were to read them, just as you have them in Matthew chapter 13, you would find one parable, and then you would find Jesus Christ explaining that parable. And then he told uh, parable number two, parable number three and parable number four and then he explained number two so you'd have parable one and then the explanation parables two three and four and then the explanation of two no explanation of three and four and then he would speak five six and seven and explain seven without explaining four and five and then he explains and then he speaks eight without explaining it now this is rather uh incomprehensible on, uh, on first look. But let's go through that again. You have explanations of only three out of the eight parables. Jesus explains three of them. He explains the first one, the second one, and the seventh one. But as they are given to us here, not in that order. Uh, he tells one, explains one. Tells two, three, and four, explains two. Tells uh, five, six, and seven, explains seven, and then tells number eight. Now, if you uh, compared the account that you have in Matthew with the account you have, uh, for instance, in the, in the Gospel of Mark, you'd probably come to this conclusion, that what actually happened chronologically was this, that he told four parables to the multitudes. He had great masses of people there, and he probably spoke four parables, one right after the other, 
and all of them, he said, were about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like unto. He calls it a mystery. And he no doubt told these four parables before the whole multitude. And then if you read carefully, he sent the multitude away and just carried his disciples with him. Not only the twelve, but he called at this point all of those disciples who really believed in him and really trusted him, probably the disciples with quite a number of others. We'll, if you read the Mark account, you'd see that it was one of the others and not one of the twelve that asked him this question about why he spoke in miracles. So he probably told four of the parables to the multitudes and then sent the multitudes away and went to the house, went to his house or where he was staying and took these people with him, explained the first two of the four that he told to the multitude. And then after he explained two of the four, he said, now by this explanation, you should know the meaning of all of the parables. And then he told them three more. And the, he gave a short word of explanation of the seventh of those, and after he gave that short word of explanation, he asked them if they understood what he was talking about, and they said they did. And so then he told the, the eighth one. Now, the reason these eight parables are so interesting to us is because, now listen carefully, if you'll, if you'll, listen, if you'll read them carefully, you'll find this, that they constitute, in a sense, the pre-written or the, the, uh, the pre-happening of the church age. That is to say, they look forward to those things that are going to happen in our time, beginning with the early church and progressing on until the Lord comes again. What Jesus Christ is doing is telling about a period of history before it ever happened. He's telling it in advance, and it happens to be that period of history in which we live. And that's what makes it so important and so interesting to us. And it's all the more interesting in that he didn't tell it so that it's easily recognized. And what we're going to do in these next few weeks is having a good time finding out just what he said about the age that we live in and why he said it and what we can learn from that. And we're going to go to different places in the Bible and find uh, for sure how we can know that and to know that that's the truth. Now what we want to do... We want to set the Gospel of Matthew uh, in the four Gospels, in the perspective that it needs to be for you to fully understand these parables about the mysteries of the kingdom. And to do this, we need first to go back to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. Now, that'll be just about in the middle of your Bible, a large book, book of Isaiah, and we want to look in chapter 40 of Isaiah. Now, let me tell you something extremely interesting about the book of Isaiah. First, let, let me ask you a question. How many books are there in the Bible? All right. How many chapters are in Isaiah? 66. Now, the first 39 chapters of Isaiah correspond to the message that you'll find in the Old Testament. And the last 27 chapters of Isaiah correspond to the message that you find in the New Testament. This is very interesting about the book of Isaiah. Now, how can you know that right offhand? All right, if this is true, if the first 39 chapters correspond to the Old Testament and the last 27 chapters correspond to the New Testament, where would you expect to find the ministry of John the Baptist in Isaiah? You'd expect to find it in chapter 40, wouldn't you? Because... The ministry of John the Baptist even preceded the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if, if this is true, if the, if the uh, early part or if the uh, last 27 chapters represent the New Testament, then right in the very front of that 27 chapters, you would expect to find the ministry of John the Baptist. In exact, and that's exactly where you find it in chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight uh, in the desert a highway for our God. If you want to check, you can find that in Matthew chapter 3, in Mark chapter 1, in Luke chapter 3, and in John chapter 1, all four Gospels tell you that this passage in Isaiah chapter 40 is talking about John the Baptist and what his message is going to be. Now, here's something else interesting about Isaiah. Now, we're not studying the book of Isaiah, but I hope this will uh, help you to be intrigued with the book. Uh, the last 27 chapters 
uh, divide themselves into three parts of nine chapters each. Now, and you find the ministry of Christ all through this first part. Now, uh, you'll, you'll see that in just a moment. If this is true, there's a correspondence between the last 27 chapters in Isaiah and the New Testament, approximately where would you find the crucifixion of Christ? Somewhere uh, in the 50s, wouldn't you? And that's where you find it, in Isaiah chapter 53. And if you want to really uh, see a remarkable uh, thing, read the last two chapters in Isaiah and the last two chapters in Revelation, and, and you say, my, it's talking about exactly the same thing. And that's right. You'd be right. So we find that the ministry of Christ is right where it should be. The death of Christ is where it should be. The pronouncement of his coming is right where it should be uh, to have this parallel. Now, of course, you have prophecies concerning Christ in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, but you also have prophecies concerning Christ in the Old Testament, don't you? So the parallel still fits. That's just something extra. That's not part of the Bible study tonight at all. In fact, is uh, that's going to make you stay five minutes late to get that in because that had to be tucked in uh, between the regular Bible study. Anyway, uh, let's, we're in, in Isaiah chapter 40. And I want you to look at verse 9 of chapter 40, the last three words. Uh, those last three words is, Behold your God. Now, what God is saying is, I want you to look at something. I want you to look at your God. And then in the next two verses, he describes the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. What God the Father is doing here, he's calling God the Son, God. And he does that frequently in the Old Testament as well as the New. These, you'll, you'll recognize that these uh, chapter 10 and 11 are descriptive of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice those three words uh, in the, the last three words in verse 9. Behold your God. He's talking to Israel as a nation. And he's telling Israel, the nation, that Jesus Christ is their God. All right? Now turn on over in Isaiah to chapter 42. And look at the first three words there. And we see, Behold my servant. Here again, God is talking to Israel. In uh, Isaiah chapter 40, he said, Behold your God, Israel. And here he's saying, Behold my servant, Israel. And again, he's talking about Jesus because Jesus quotes these verses, the verses 1, 2, and 3 of Isaiah chapter 40. And in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus will tell you. Now, if you want to take it down, it's Matthew 12, verses 18 through 21. In Matthew 12, 18 through 21, Jesus says that these words are about him. This uh, Isaiah uh, uh, 42, 1, 2, and 3. He says it's about his ministry when he came to earth. It fits right where it should be. fit, see, right after the ministry of John the Baptist. And he says that when God says, Behold my servant, he says, God's talking about me. Now, Jesus will tell you that in Matthew chapter 12. So, God says to Israel, Behold your God. And he points to Christ. He says, Behold my servant. And he points to Christ. All right? In uh, Isaiah chapter 40, uh, 52, Isaiah 52, verse 13, and we have these same, servant, uh, these same uh, words again. Behold my servant. Now, the servant had a ministry to perform, and we had that back over the 42nd chapter, and he had a death to die, and we have that in the 52nd and the 53rd chapter. You can see that, that whole passage beginning with Isaiah 52, 13, extending all the way down through the end of chapter 53 are descriptive of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. You may remember uh, the story in the 8th chapter of Acts where the Ethiopian eunuch was riding along a desert road and he was reading from this 53rd chapter of Isaiah. We're told he was. He, he, read, he was reading along there and remember Philip came and Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, oh, how can I understand what I'm reading if no man will tell me? He says, is the prophet speaking of himself or is he speaking some, of someone else? And Philip, and we're told that Philip started at that same place in Isaiah chapter 53 and preached to, uh, unto him Jesus. Uh, so Phil, uh, we're told in Acts chapter 8 that the Isaiah chapter uh, 53 is about Jesus. And of course, all we have to do is read it and it's, it's very easy for us to see that, isn't it? So here again... Uh, Israel is told by God, Behold my servant. And then he describes something about the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have, Behold your God, Israel, and behold my servant, Israel. 
Now let's turn over to the Old Testament book of Zechariah. That's uh, the next to the last book in the Old Testament. And so if you have a hard time finding it, just go back to Matthew, then thumb back two books and you got it. Uh, Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man, whose name is the branch. Now, in some of your Bibles, that name, the branch, will be in all capitals, because the translator realized that he was speaking about deity. The branch is one of the Old Testament names of Jesus. He's called that twice in Isaiah, twice in Jeremiah, and twice in Zechariah. And uh, uh, this is part of our story, too, if we don't have time to get into it. But behold the man whose name is the branch, and then he's going to describe something about the branch. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and he shall sit and rule upon his throne. He shall be a priest upon a throne. That can only be talking about Jesus Christ, because no Old Testament priest could ever be a king, and no king could ever be a priest. They had to be separated. But the priest king is Jesus Christ, the only one. And the only person who could be a priest upon his throne is Jesus Christ, both priest and king. He's priest now, and he's the coming king. So here again, God is talking to Israel, and he's talking about Jesus, and he says, Behold the man. So he said, Behold your God, behold my servant, and behold the man. All right, Zechariah chapter 9. supposed to be studying Matthew, and we're all over the Old Testament. Uh, uh, Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold thy king. Behold thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, uh, upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now we're told in Matthew 21, and also the other Gospels, that this is a prophecy of what we call Palm Sunday the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ. This verse in Zechariah is quoted in Matthew 21, verses 4 and 5, and in the other Gospels also, and it says that this is the fulfillment of the prophecy by Zechariah in Zechariah 9, 9, and that's exactly what we're talking about here. And so God is saying again to Israel, Behold thy king. So we have this fourfold exhortation to stop and pay attention. That's what behold means. Stop what you're doing and pay attention because God has something important to say. And when you get your attention, he says, Behold your king, behold my servant, behold the man, and behold your God. Now we get into the New Testament. The New Testament is what God, in the New Testament, God is saying in the book of Matthew, Behold your king. The book of Matthew presents Jesus Christ as God's uh, man to be king. It presents Jesus Christ the king. Now, you don't have to wonder about that because the very first book, the very first chapter in Matthew gives thee his kingly heritage, his pedigree. He's the son of David, uh, uh, the son of Abraham. And no king of Israel could be king unless he was both of those things because he received uh, the throne through David and the, and the right to the promises through Abraham. God gave covenants. He gave a, a covenant to Abraham which call, is called the Abrahamic covenant. He gave a covenant to David which is called the Davidic covenant. To Abraham, he gave the promises that his heritage, his seed, his offspring would be the one through, all the, through whom all the peoples of the earth would be blessed. That's why you're called a child of Abraham through faith if you've received Christ as your Savior. And then, you see, uh, David was given the promise that that he would never lack a son to sit on the throne. He was told that the the, uh, king would have to come from him. So this is why you have it, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then you have the genealogy. You have to have a genealogy if you're going to tell the story of a king, or or else it doesn't count. He, he, uh, He obtains the throne because... He inherits the throne because uh, of his 
heritage or his lineage. So it's the lineage of the king. You say, but uh, but there's a genealogy in Luke. Well, we'll come to that in a moment. Yes, the genealogy is different. All you have to do is read it and see. And both are gene- genealogies of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we'll get to that in a moment. Now, also in Matthew, you have the only account of the kingly gifts. You you look all through uh, Mark, Luke, and John, and you'll have by no mention of we three kings of Orient are, are bearing gifts we travel afar. Because you see, gold, frankincense, and myrrh are all kingly gifts. You'll find no record of that in the other Gospels. It would be out of place there because it's Matthew. It's the Gospel of the King. It's God saying to the whole world, Behold your king. And we'll, we'll cover that a little bit more. Now, you have the story of the birth of Christ at the beginning of Matthew because you must establish how he came into the earth. His, the birth of a king is very important. Now, in contrast, when you get over to Mark, there's not a mention of his birth or his childhood, his pedigree or kingly gifts. He starts right out working. In the very first chapter of Mark, he's going about uh, preaching and, uh, and doing the work of his father. So you see... Matthew is, Behold your king. Mark is, Behold my servant. Mark is the gospel of the suffering, laboring servant. A whole different way of saying things, and yet it's the same story. Only God could do that. That's one way, one thing that makes our heart cry out within us. Surely, this is God's word. Then we go on over to Luke, and we find that Luke presents Jesus Christ as a perfect human being. There again, you have his genealogy. But the book doesn't start out with his genealogy. It starts out with uh, who his mother was and who his father was and who his kinfolks were and all that, you see. And when you get to the genealogy, if you read carefully, you find that it's the genealogy of Mary, not the genealogy of Joseph. You see, he inherited the throne through his, so to speak, foster father, Joseph, who was in the lineage of David as far as as the kingly line was was concerned. But the genealogy in Luke is the genealogy of Mary. And here's something interesting too. The genealogy in Matthew starts with Abraham and David. See, it'll tell you that there were 14 generations uh, from... uh, Well, well, it it doesn't tell you there were 14 generations from uh, from Abraham... uh, to the next important personage and 14 more to the next important personage and all divided up into 14s. But there were 20 generations before Abraham and they're not even mentioned in Matthew because they're not important because his kingship didn't stem from Adam. He didn't, he didn't inherit his kingship from Adam or from Noah. But he did inherit his humanity from Adam. And Adam must be in the genealogy and you'll find it in Luke where you're hearing the story of Jesus as a human being because Luke, you see, is behold the man who was going to sit on the throne as a priest. You see, a priest is a man, always a man. A priest is a man who represents men before God. That's why uh, uh, Paul wrote in Timothy, he says, um, wrote to Timothy, uh, he says, there's but one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. The mediator must be a man. There's a man in the heavenlies to represent us. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, these things I write unto you that you sin not. But if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. There's a man to represent us. And Luke presents the story of that man. Behold the man. Did you ever wonder? Uh, Luke's the... uh, the only uh, gospel where you find all of these stories about uh, when he was a little boy and taken to the temple and, and when he was circumcised and dedicated and then when he was 12 years old. You don't, you don't find That's a human interest story. That's about Jesus the human being. That's where it says he grew in wisdom and stature in his mind and his social relationships and his uh, spiritual relationships and so forth. That's in Luke. We'll find it elsewhere. And the, and the stories are told in Luke from a human interest standpoint. Well, then we get to the book of John. 
We've got one left. That's behold your God. See, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Same was in the beginning with God, and the Word was made flesh. So you see, in Matthew, God is saying, Behold your king. In Mark, behold my servant. In Luke, behold the man. And in John, behold your God. Now, this is not the only uh, place you see this truth brought before you in the Old Testament. For instance, in uh, when we're studying Ezekiel, remember, we saw the cherubim, and they had four faces. They had the face of a lion, then they had the face of a man, and they had the uh, face of an ox, and they had the face of an eagle. Well, in the Bible, when you see a lion used figuratively, he's a king. I suppose that's why we call him the king of the beasts, and that's why uh, Great Britain has a, a lion as their, as their symbol, and other nations have had. Lions is to be symbolic uh, of their um, of the royal house. So uh, the the lion is Jesus Christ presented as he is in Matthew as the king, and uh, then uh, you have an ox. Well, wherever an ox is used in the Bible figuratively, uh, he speaks of a servant because an ox is a perfect servant, and uh, he's portrayed as this. And then after that, you have the face of a man, which, of course, stands for itself. And then you have the face of an eagle. Well, the eagle is the heavenly one. It stands for the deity of Christ, the fact that he came down from heaven. So, uh, you see, you have, this, you have this portrayed in the cherubim, the four faces of the cherubim. These four gospels are, are portrayed. And you see the four gospels portrayed in, uh, in the name, the branch. Each branch stands for one of the Gospels, and then this matter of behold. And other places, somewhat more subtly, uh, no doubt even way back in the early part of Genesis, you may read a very strange uh, word there uh, that says that uh, there was a river that flowed out of the Garden of Eden, and as it went out of the Garden of Eden, it divided itself into four parts that it might water the whole earth. Now, we don't think of a river dividing itself out into four parts. Usually it's four streams come in and form one river. But you see, that's exactly what happened. The, the, the river in the Bible, you have river all through the Bible. God's river is, is eternal life. It flowed from God and where his presence was, and then it flows out all over the earth, see, in, in the gospel. And so you see, all of these are the reasons why we have four gospels. And uh, some see this in the four posts of the door to the uh, uh, tabernacle and many other places in the Bible. This uh, prefiguring of the four Gospels are four different portraits of Christ. Someone who says, well, why didn't God just put all the details together and make one story? And uh, somebody that was trying to explain that was says one time there was a, a man uh, that, uh, that loved his wife very, very dearly. And uh, when she was still rather young, she died. And uh, he wanted uh, to be reminded of her. So on her on his bedroom, he had a, a four-fold uh, photograph holder. And he found four different pictures of her. And each one of those pictures uh, showed her in a different mood, in, uh, in a little different aspect. And uh, someone asked him why he had four pictures. And he, he said, because uh, I remember different things when I when I see this picture. Well, imagine him trying to cut up those four pictures and sort of paste the parts together and make one picture uh, out of the four. It wouldn't work, would it? Well, neither would it work to try to make one picture of the earthly ministry of Christ by taking the four Gospels and trying to put them all together as one picture. It's four pictures, and yet it's one picture. Just like uh, that young husband on his desk. He had four pictures but there's just one picture, wasn't it? In in a, in a marvelous way. Okay. So I trust this has helped us to set the stage for Matthew as, as a book in the Bible, uh, set its place for us. Now, in the first chapter of Matthew, as we pointed out before, you have the genealogy of Christ and the birth of Christ. This is very important with the king. 
in uh, chapter 2, you have him recognized by earthly rulers as the king, and he's brought uh, the kingly gifts, and you see his life protected. In uh, verse 3, you have, uh, the, uh, chapter 3, you have the story of John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is the heralder. You know, uh, a king, before he comes, he always has a herald out in front of him to trumpet his arrival. And that's who John the Baptist was. He heralded the king. And he had a message. I want you to see it in Matthew chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now this phrase, kingdom of heaven, is only used in the book of Matthew. Uh, you have kingdom used elsewhere, kingdom of God or, or various things. But this particular phrase, kingdom of heaven, is peculiar to the book of Matthew, and it's used 32 times. Well, that's remarkable in itself, isn't it? And remember, over in the 13th chapter, where we're going to be studying, we're going to be studying the kingdom of heaven? No. We're, we're going to be studying the kingdom of heaven in a certain aspect. While it's a mystery, <clears throat> one day it's going to be unfolded. But while it's a mystery, we're going to study it. We're going to study something that's not understandable to the unsaved world because God wrote it in such a way that an unsaved person can't understand it. And he knows how to do that. But I want you to notice what John preached. He didn't say, he didn't say this, he didn't say, uh, uh, be a good witness, and lead a lot of people to Christ, didn't say that. He had one message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that phrase at hand means has come near to you. Now, and so in chapter 3, we have the king heralded. In chapter 4, we have the king tested by the greatest power other than deity, and that was Satan. And he withstood the temptation and proved his right to conquer all. You see, Satan took dominion from man. God says, man shall have dominion. And he gave dominion to man. Man forfeited it to a being more powerful than he was. And so when Christ came on the scene, Satan had to, uh, to try him or test him. And if you want to know why Christ was tried, it was, it was actually Satan's uh, way of uh, saying he could be the, be the wheel. Remember, he said, Christ, if you will bow down and worship me, I'll do so and so. And Christ proved his mastery over the one who took dominion from man. And this established his right uh, to be king. We have that in the, uh, the fourth chapter. And then later on in the fourth chapter, we have his, his ministry or his proclamation. Now let's see what his proclamation was. He's going to say exactly the same thing his herald said. His herald said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now look at chapter 4, verse 13, verse 17. From that time, that is when he began his ministry, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Exactly the same message that his herald had. And then in chapters 5, 6, and 7, we call that the... Sermon on the Mount, actually what it is, it's the uh, governing principles of the kingdom which the king is offering to establish. See, the king is offering himself to his people. And he says, if you will accept my kingship, this is how things will operate. And right in the middle of it, when the disciples say, well, teach us to pray, he says, all right, here's the prayer you should pray. And we have this in chapter 6, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. John the Baptist says, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The disciples says, What will we pray? Pray that the kingdom will come. What kingdom? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of heaven come to earth. Now that prayer has never been answered. There's a reason why. The kingdom of heaven has never come to this earth to rule. We could never say, since this prayer was first uttered, 
that it's been done on earth as it is in heaven. Never has there been a time in this earth's history when it was ruled under heavenly principles. But there will be a time. But there has not been a time up to now. Now, this that we call the Sermon on the Mount, which is probably the most familiar three chapters in all the Bible, was not written primarily for you and I. It was not written as a code of ethics for a Christian. Now, it just wasn't. Neither was this prayer written as a model prayer for you. It was, it was given to those who wanted the kingdom to come. Now, you, you can prove this. Uh, for instance, look at, uh, look at chapter 5, verse 42. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away, thou away. The kingdom message is that whoever would borrow, you're to lend. But that's not the message for Christians today. All you have to do is to read the epistles, and the epistles will tell you that you're to uh, husband all of your gifts for the ongoing of the gospel message. You're not supposed to dissipate your earthly uh, belongings to anybody that might want to borrow uh, some money to use on his own uh, usage. No. This is only valid if the kingdom of heaven was ruling, were ruling on earth. Then it would be valid. And many other instructions here would be the same. For instance, verse 40, And if any man will sue thee at law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Well, now, uh, Jesus meant exactly what he said. He meant that if anybody wants your coat, give it to him. And then something besides. But he's not telling you to do that. He just isn't. We're going to see this as we go along. No. You're to utilize whatever God has placed in your possession towards the ongoing of spreading the gospel message to all the world. That's what you're to do. And this is explained for us very carefully in other parts of the Bible. Because, you see, Jesus was not telling you in the Sermon on the Mount how to live in this present age. He was telling you how you would live under the kingdom. That's what he was telling you. And he was offering this. Now, it is true. A large part of what he said there would be uh, well worth heeding in our day, and it was all written for our instruction. And uh, much of what was written there was for us, to, uh, because God doesn't change, his mind's the same. But the circumstances changed. Listen, the circumstances when Jesus Christ reigns as king openly on this earth are not going to be the same as they are now. And our method of procedure won't be the same as they are now. Methods will be different. It's not that God changes, but uh, the instructions that he gives to those who would follow him change according to the circumstances. Some of the instructions in the Bible are for the saints that's living during the tribulation. You won't be here if you're saved today. But he gives instructions as to what to do. Very precise instructions. He says, uh, uh, he says not to do certain things on the Sabbath day. And he, and he says uh, uh, various things that just wouldn't even make any sense to you to try to follow. Because they are specific instructions for the people of God for a particular time. Now, when is this kingdom going to come? Well, let's, let's go on and we'll see, we'll see what the story is. So that you'll know, in six, uh, 5, 6, and 7, he's giving the rule or the procedures that will govern the kingdom. In chapters 8 and 9, we have... Ten of his many miracles. You can count them. There's ten miracles in those two chapters. And there are miracles, all of which could only be performed by God, by someone who was divine. divine. And uh, many of them tell the results of sin. For instance, the first one tells of the defilement of sin, and the second one, the deadliness of sin. Uh, and uh, the third one, the disabling of sin. And... Uh, uh, another one, the degradation of sin, and another one, the dependency of the sinner, and so forth. They have a purpose. Each of those ten miracles, you'll find ten of them in those two chapters. And by this, uh, Christ establishes the fact that the king is God, and he can do 
godly things. He can raise the sick. He can raise the dead. Uh, he, he does all types of miracles. In these, uh, he stills the water. He does things only God could do, and he does ten of them. And you'll see many places in the Bible you'll have exactly ten situations, no more, no less. And it means that ought to be sufficient for all God's prayer. You ought to be able to read those ten and realize. You ought to get the message after you've read the ten. That's why, of course, in the first chapter of Genesis, you have those two three-letter, three-word phrases. <coughs> one of the one of the three-word phrases is, "And God said." You'll find that ten times in Genesis chapter one. Well. If God says God said ten times, that ought to be enough, and you ought to believe that God said that. And another phrase you'll find in the first chapter of Genesis ten times, a three-word phrase, is after its kind. If God said he made everything after its kind, you ought to take uh, the what uh, this world calls evolution and throw it in the creek. Because God says everything was after its kind. He says it ten times in Genesis chapter 1. And that ought to be sufficient. You ought to believe it. So many times you'll have that. Ten times. Well, there's ten miracles here in chapters 8 and 9. Now, in chapter 10, he's sending his followers forth, and he gives them a message. And before he gives them a message, his followers, he's going to give them some very strange instructions. Now, if you think all of the instructions in the Sermon on the Mount are for you, how do you like these? Chapter 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, he says, You're not to take this message to any Gentiles or any Samaritans. This message that I'm preaching is only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, when God tells us to go forth, he doesn't give us those instructions. That's not what he tells us. He's given them a lot of other instructions in here that he's not trying to tell you. We have to put these things uh, in their proper place. Now let's see what they're to, to, to preach. Verse 7 of chapter 10, And as ye go, pr uh, go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Everybody got the same message. That's what John the Baptist said. That's what Jesus said, and that's what his followers said. They're all saying the kingdom of heaven is is at hand. Well, now, now let's see. If it was at hand or very near, did it commence? No, it did not. Why didn't it? Because God had prophetically stated that the kingdom must come through the nation of Israel. And that's the only way it would come. And until Israel would receive it, the world would be denied it. And this is still true. Israel still has not received the message, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But they will. The Bible says they will. But the kingdom of heaven will not reign upon earth until Israel as a nation receives that message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's been, it was proclaimed here 2,000 years ago, and it's going to be proclaimed again. No, the message was not, not uh, believed. We're told in the Gospel of John, He came unto His own, but His own received Him not. But graciously, we're also told that to as many as did receive Him, to them gave He the power to become the children of God. That is to say, Israel as a nation turned Him down, the leaders turned Him down, but individuals received Him. And to each individual that received Him, He made Himself a true and, and powerful in their own lives. So we have here the king offering himself. He's given uh, the principles by which you govern, Matthew 7, 6, 7, uh, 5, 6, and 7. He's shown his ability uh, uh, to uh, overcome the strongest power that ever was other than God in chapter 4, and he shows his uh, power to overcome illness of all types, to overcome death, to overcome the natural forces, whatever needs to be overcome. He shows that he has the power to do the job in chapters 8 and 9. And after he shows all of this, then he tells his followers to go and preach the message. And their message was rejected. As a matter of fact, uh, they threatened to put him to death. And in chapter 12, 
they said that his message was the message of Satan. The religious leader says that what you're saying is from Satan. They knew better, but they knowingly tried to get the, uh, the, the uh, people who would hear him to reject it. So here we are up to the 13th chapter, and Christ has openly for 12 chapters <coughs> offered his message to Israel as a nation. Now he says, I'm going to put my words and my message in such a way that only those who really want me can understand what I'm going to say. You've had your chance. You've turned it down. You've called my words blasphemy, so you're not going to be privileged to understand what I'm going to say from now on. I'm going to say it in parables. And we're told from there on, he, he didn't speak to the multitudes except in parables. And those who had spiritual inclinations among them, he would open up their understanding and they could understand it. And those who didn't have, that wanted to blaspheme him, that wanted to uh, go their own way, uh, he, he stopped them from hearing. They weren't able to, to comprehend what he was saying anymore. He'd spoken to them very plainly up to that point, And they rejected his message. Now, when will this kingdom come? Well, at first he tells us some things that are going to be so that you can recognize it. For instance, look back in chapter 8 of Matthew. He says uh, in Matthew 8, verse 11, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So one thing we know, we know that when the kingdom of heaven is here in manifestation, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to be right there sitting down. See, now, this, this is the kingdom of heaven, but it's on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a heavenly kingdom on earth. And when that heavenly kingdom's here, uh, if you're a subject of that kingdom, you're going to uh, be able to go where the king is, and you're going to see uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob there. And you can say, well, Abraham, you know, I always want to ask you something. Uh, it so, sort of mystified me. You remember when you cut that calf half in two, and there was this burning thing here, and it burning through here, and you went through the middle of it like that, and you shoot all the buzzards off of it? How come you did that? See? Yeah, you can read all about that. It's in the Bible, but... Uh, and you can ask those fellows because they're going to be sitting right there. That's what it says. That's one way you'll know it. All right, turn over to the 19th chapter of Matthew. Verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, say unto you that Ye who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man, that's speaking of himself, shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Yes, sir. And you'll know exactly when, uh, you'll know exactly when uh, that kingdom's uh, going on here on earth. Because there'll be a capital city, there'll be a king there, and uh, besides that, the, the twelve apostles will be there, and, and each one of them will be the head of one of the twelve tribes. That's so right there, doesn't it? And you can go up there, and you said, uh, you can say, uh, Peter, you remember back then, back there where uh, they threw you in jail, and they had just beheaded James, and then they told you they're going to behead you first thing in the morning. And they put chains on you and put all those Roman soldiers around you and put you in a dungeon and said, we're going to cut off your head in the morning. And what would you do? You went right fast asleep. How would you do that? I would have been worried stiff. And he'll tell you. Of course, if you read the Bible, it'll tell you now why. You know, don't you? Because Jesus told him in John 21 that he's going to live to be an old man. And so he believed it, see. So they told him he's going to cut up. This story's in the 12th chapter of Acts, by the way. They, they said, the king's going to cut up your head in the morning, Peter. And Peter says, this is what the king says. Jesus said, I was going to live to be an old man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to bed and get a good night's sleep so I can see how this thing comes out in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, the angel woke him up in the middle of the night and took him out of there. But you know, you'll have some things to ask him. Now, that's how you'll know whether the kingdom's here or not. Because it's, there they'll be, all twelve of them. You say, well, how about Judas? Well, no, you remember there's another guy who took his place. 
Uh, but that's what Jesus says. That that's how you can tell the kingdom will be here. Now, when will it be? What? We don't have to wonder about these things. Look in Matthew chapter 25. Somebody asked him that. See, uh, in uh, chapter 24... Uh, verse 3, Matthew 24, 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the age? See, they asked him. Well, he took quite a little while to explain it here, because beginning right at the fourth verse of that 24th chapter, he starts explaining the things that are going to have to happen before he comes again. That's what he's doing. And then uh, in chapter 25, you see, he gets down to... Uh, about uh, verse 31 when he gets through telling all the things that are going to happen in the intervening years and he says when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep and, from the goats uh, and he shall say to the sheep on the, his right hand the goats on his left then shall the king say unto them on his right hand come ye blessed of the father he says you need wonder when it's going to be, I'll tell you what it's going to be. It's going to be when I come in glory with all the holy angels. Now, that's not happened yet. Well, where's Jesus now? Is he a king now? Well, he has a kingly position because he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's not sitting on his own throne. His own throne is going to be in the city of Jerusalem. He's now sat down at the right hand of the Father to represent you. The, the whole Bible from here on out tells us that's where he is. You can find it three times in the book of Hebrews. He has sat down there. That's where he is. He's not on his throne, but he's going to be. When will that be? Well, it'll be at a time when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's there. It'll be a time when the twelve apostles are sitting around him. And it'll be when he comes in his glory with all of his holy angels and every eye shall behold him. That's not happened yet. Well, what's going on in the meantime? That's what Matthew chapter 13 is all about. See, he was rejected at that time. And Paul, in his epistles, go to a lot of trouble to explain to us that Israel as a nation has been set aside for a time. And during this time, God is calling out a special people for his own name from all the nations of the world. That's where you and I come in. That's what he's doing today. He's been doing that for almost 2,000 years, and he's almost through doing it. How do we know? Because Matthew 13 is not the only chapter in the Bible that tells us the things that have to happen during this intervening time. It's just one of the chapters. Another aspect of it is in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Another aspect of it is in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And then in the epistles, we're told many other things. And you see, and when Jesus says, when all of these things have come to pass, then you know the time is at hand. And that's never been until our day. So the time when he's calling out a people for his name from among all the nations of the world is almost over. And the time when he's going to come in power to reign is almost here. And then it's going to be answered. That prayer that people prayed, they don't know. You know, people stand up in church and they repeat by rote, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, they don't know what they're saying. But it's a valid prayer. Our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You want to pray that prayer? It's perfectly all right with me. It's a good, valid prayer. It was particularly for the people of that time. And it'll be particularly for the people uh, during the time of the tribulation. But if your heart cries out because you'd like to see the kingdom come, personally, I'd rather uh, pray for the rapture, you might say. I'd rather uh, look for the blessed hope when Christ is going to come for us. But there's nothing wrong with praying, uh, having a heart's desire for the kingdom to come. That's all right. I don't care. You think that they put it to a pretty tune, and if you get thrilled, goosebumps when somebody that really has a voice sings that, well, it's all right with me. I don't want to take that away from you. It's all right. Now, so, 
this chapter is about the kingdom while the kingdom is hidden to the world. That's what it's all about. And you see, Christ is a king today, and he has a kingdom. But it is not being manifested here on earth. The world is not in subjection to that kingdom. You don't think it is, do you? You don't see this world as being subjugated to the king, do you? Doesn't look like that to me. No. So, he has a kingdom, but it's in a hidden form. It's hidden from the world. And if you're saved, if you receive this king as your savior, if you have taken advantage of what he did when he came as the servant, when God says, Behold my servant, if you've ever beheld him as the servant of God, who was obedient even unto death, you see, you're part of that kingdom. People just don't recognize you for your royal blood. Uh, that you're uh, a little too odd to be part of the ruling class. But you are if, you're, if you've received Christ because the message of the Bible is that we reign with him. You see, so uh, there's a kingdom. It's just not manifested yet. And this 13th chapter of Matthew is about that period of time that you live in and it's about you and, and your neighbors, the people around you. Jesus told about it in parabolic form before it ever happened. And that ought to make it very interesting to us. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you that you do permit some people to understand and that when you talked in parables, you didn't intend for your deep truths to be hidden from every ear. And Lord, we thank you that those of us who have claimed Christ as our Savior, those of you who have come and acknowledged our own sinfulness and say, God, we long for the King to come. Lord, we thank you that you privilege us to know these truths. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.